Okay, so our last topic before we start talking about um, radiation uh, is heat exchangers. So heat exchangers are um, usually internal flow problems, and they are um, these devices that are basically the core of most thermal fluid systems uh, where heat is transferred from one fluid uh, to another fluid. And uh, you can literally find these things anywhere. It's kind of hard to overstate their importance in terms of, um, you know, the, the design, that their design and how that is related to the design of most systems or cycles. Um, you know, a lot of the times what you'll find when people talk about designing thermal fluid systems, what they're really talking about is uh, optimizing the design of the heat exchanger because the heat exchanger is usually the most uh, important thing in terms of the performance of the system and uh, almost always it's the, the largest part of the system and the most expensive part of the system. So, you know, you just naturally end up spending kind of a lot of time thinking about uh, what the heat exchanger should look like. So heat exchangers come into uh, come in sort of two uh, categories. We have uh, direct transfer heat exchangers. So that's um, what's shown up here in the top. And that's a, a situation where you're actually literally transferring heat directly from one fluid to another fluid through some kind of a wall. All right, so that's actually the more typical uh, situation. So here we have a hot fluid that's flowing in this annular space. Um, and we have a cold fluid that's flowing inside of this tube. And the hot fluid is transferring energy to the cold fluid across the wall uh, of this tube. Right? That's a direct transfer heat exchanger. The other type of heat exchanger that's a little less common is what's called an indirect transfer heat exchanger. And in this case, you have heat being transferred from the hot fluid to some kind of secondary storage medium and then later on in time, it will be transferred to the cold fluid. Right? So um, this is uh, sometimes called a regenerative heat exchanger, and these come in different um, uh, sort of designs as well. Here's a design that uh, you, you might actually find in a house, at least a newer build house, where we have uh, a, a regenerative heat exchanger or some kind of a wheel. So. Um, this is a way of, of um, recovering some energy uh, for, your, for your heating and cooling system. So imagine uh, it's the middle of winter and you are uh, trying to heat your house. Um, any building, it turns out, you, you not only have to condition it at the right space, you also have to ventilate it. So there's a, some kind of a, um, a requirement or a specification as to what kind of flow rates you need to continually bring into your house of, of new clean air and then you know expel obviously a nearly equal amount of flow rate back out to the atmosphere. So in the middle of winter you're bringing in air from outside that's really cold and you have to heat that air up and then you know force it through ducts usually and, and put it into your house. Um, and then you know at the same time you're taking warm air that's already been heated out of your house and just throwing it away. right? So obviously what you really want to do is take the warm air and use it to preheat the cold air um, and, and, and that way you, your furnace has to work less hard and there's different ways of doing this uh, but one way is with this uh, regenerative wheel so this is an indirect transfer heat exchanger you take this warm air that's coming out of your house and uh, this is a, a big wheel that's spinning all the time so it's spending some time in the warm air duct it's spending some other time in the cold air duct um, it's actually full of these little holes that the air flows through. So the warm air is flowing through these holes and that's tending to warm up the material in this duct, I'm sorry, in this wheel. And then the warm material as it gets to this point here and starts to rotate into the cold duct, now it's exposed to this cold outdoor air. So the warm material is going to actually transfer energy to the cold outdoor air, warming it up. Right. So that's going to continue until I get over here and then the cycle is going to repeat. So this is an indirect transfer heat exchanger in that the warm air is not transferring energy directly to the cold air. Instead, it's transferring energy to the wheel material and then the wheel material is transferring it to the cold air. Right? And this is um, a, a, <coughs> a device that works um, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, a lot of times they'll coat this device with some kind of a desiccant so you can also transfer 
uh, moisture, right? So you can take some moisture out of the warm air and transfer it to the cold air. And it works equally well in the middle of summer when this is super hot, um, super moist air, and you want to transfer that energy um, to the air from the room, and you want to transfer some of that moisture to the air from the room. So you can go both directions with this. All right, we're not going to talk in this class uh, about indirect transfer heat exchangers. There's some information in the book about them if you're interested. Uh, we're going to focus on direct transfer heat exchangers. Um, direct transfer heat exchangers are still classified uh, in different ways based on their configuration. Right? So um, if you think about what makes a heat exchanger complicated to analyze, it's the fact that the hot air comes in or the hot fluid comes in at some high temperature, the cold fluid comes in at some cold temperature, and they don't stay at those temperatures. They tend to um, change temperature. The hot fluid temperature drops, the cold fluid temperature rises, and the manner that this temperature difference evolves depends on the orientation of those flows relative to one another. And that orientation is captured in what we call the configuration, right? So how does the hot flow relative to the cold flow, right? What's the directionality of those flows? And depending on the directionality, you're going to get very different temperature um, distributions. And that's all the configuration is, is saying. So parallel flow, counter flow, um, we'll look at some examples of those. Cross flow, that means the fluids are, are flowing perpendicular to each other. Shell and tube is... Um, pretty common, but something uh, a little bit different than any of these. So let's start with the, the easiest ones to understand. Those are parallel flow and counter flow. So our shell and our, uh, tube and tube heat exchanger, let's go back to that because that's the easiest way to make uh, a parallel flow or counter flow heat exchanger. So my tube and tube heat exchanger is literally what it sounds like. I take a small tube and I shove it inside of a bigger tube and I now have a uh, obviously a place for fluid to flow in the small tube and then there's another place for fluid to flow in the space between the small tube and the big tube so this annular space so that's a tube and tube heat exchanger depending on how this i plumb this i can have either a parallel flow or a counter flow so this is a case where i've plumbed my tube and tube heat exchanger in a way that the hot fluid comes in on the left and flows through that annular space from left to right the cold fluid comes in also on the left and flows through the tube from left to right these flows are flowing in the same direction. That's a parallel flow heat exchanger, right? If I just take the hot fluid and instead of bringing it in uh, on the left side, I replumb it so that now, I find my pointer, so that now I'm going to bring it in on the right side and it flows from right to left. This is uh, 180 degrees from this, right? This is now a counterflow heat exchanger. And the, the behavior of these two heat exchangers under um, co most conditions is going to be about as different as two heat exchangers can be, right? So if you think about how this heat exchanger is going to behave, you know, as I move from left to right, two things happen, right? As I, as I move in the direction of the flow, the hot fluid temperature is going to drop, right? And the cold fluid that's coming into the tube, its temperature is going to rise. So I'm going to get this temperature difference that starts out really high, get a large rate of heat transfer at the inlet, and then as the hot fluid temperature drops and the cold fluid temperature rises, that temperature difference is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. I'm going to get a, a small temperature difference at the exit, right? If I go over here, the opposite sort of thing happens. Now, the hot fluid temperature comes in hot, the cold fluid temperature comes in over here cold, the cold fluid temperature rises, the hot fluid temperature drops, my temperature difference is never, never in this heat exchanger is as, as big as in this heat exchanger, right? Um, but it doesn't also drop uh, as much as it does in this heat exchanger, right? So th these two heat exchangers, because the temperature, because of how they're plumbed, because of their configuration, same physical device, but the configuration causes them to be um, as different as any two heat exchangers can be, actually, in terms of in terms of performance, right? So you can also see from these figures the complication that we're going to run into in terms of analyzing the heat exchanger, right? In order to analyze the heat exchanger, I'm going to have to do an energy balance on the hot fluid and an energy balance on the cold fluid. And those two energy balances are going to be coupled by the fact that the temperature difference between the hot fluid and the cold fluid, that's what's driving the heat transfer, right? So whatever, hot, whatever energy the hot fluid releases, that has to go to the cold fluid. And that rate of energy transfer is driven by this hot to cold fluid temperature difference.
All right, so that's a parallel flow and a counter flow heat exchanger. You have um, cases that are sort of between these two limits. So, um, well, before we get to that, uh, let's look at some examples of how you'd make these parallel flow, counter flow heat exchangers um, maybe a little bit more realistically than a tube and tube heat exchanger. A tube and tube heat exchanger is not something you'll find often. It's just not a very good way of making a heat exchanger. Um, but uh, you can make these things uh, using a plate heat exchanger. So here's a situation where we have, let's go over here, it's easiest to look at. We have um, a whole bunch of plates that uh, we just basically stack up. And <clears throat> what happens then is the way these plates are gasketed and headered, if I bring the hot fluid in right here, the hot fluid is gonna have access to flow in every other plate. So here, this, this, this uh, opening is going to be open to the hot fluid. It's going to be able to go this direction. Um, on the flip side, if I bring the cold fluid in here, the way that this uh, is put together, this opening here won't be open to the cold fluid. So it will not be able to flow into this plate. But if I go to the next plate, this opening will be open so that the cold fluid can flow uh, this way. The hot fluid cannot flow into this opening, right? So what you're getting is a parallel or you're getting a... Um, Either well, either a parallel or a counterflow heat exchanger here, where the hot fluid flows uh, in one plate, and then the cold fluid in the next plate, and then the hot fluid in the next plate, and so on and so forth, right? And you know, usually you would plumb these up to be counterflow because those are the highest uh, performance. You can see it a little bit more easily over here. So here's um, here's a situation where <clears throat> we're bringing in, let's say, the hot flow, right? The hot flow. You can see it can get into this gap right here, which means it can flow through this plate here. It cannot get into the next plate, so it's not flowing in these channels here. It can get into the next plate, so it's flowing into these channels and so forth and so on, right? So the headering and the way this is put together allow it into every other channel, right? Okay, um, one nice thing about this kind of a heat exchanger is that, uh, you know, depending on the, the operating pressure and the temperature, uh, it's possible that you can literally just stack these up with gaskets uh, and then bolt it together and uh, have yourself a unit that's sort of infinitely adjustable. I mean, you can add more and more pairs of plates as much as you need in order to get the performance that you need. And then <coughs> also, when we get to this thing called fouling, you know, if this, if this heat exchanger fouls, in other words, if crap builds up on these plates, it's pretty easy to just... Um, undo these bolts, take all the plates out, lay them down, and then power wash them to get them clean again and put them back together, right? So that's a really nice feature of this kind of a, a, a plate frame heat exchanger. All right, so now we'll look at the... <coughs> sorry. Uh, a, a heat exchanger that's kind of in the middle of being parallel and counterflow, and this is called a cross-flow heat exchanger. So you'll see these all the time when you have... Uh, gas to liquid or gas to maybe a two-phase uh, liquid, right? So um, in, a, in, a, in a cross flow heat exchanger, you have the gas um, flowing, in this case, this direction is flowing through uh, all these uh, regions between fins, right? And then you have the liquid uh, or the maybe sometimes refrigerant or something that's boiling or condensing flowing in these tubes, right? So you have uh, something flowing this direction, uh, always the lower density stuff that needs the advantage of the fins and then you have something flowing this direction which is the higher density higher conductivity stuff that doesn't need the fins they're flowing up 90 degrees relative to each other so that's a cross flow situation um, you see these a lot of times in um, like uh, evaporators or condensers in building air conditioning systems you'll see these in your car they're the radiator right um, so what these different applications have in common is that they are trying to either take heat from or reject heat to air and air is a low density fluid it's not a very good heat transfer fluid air is going to be what's flowing through these fins right so that's a cross flow heat exchanger um, cross flow heat exchangers actually have to be subdivided further based on whether they're mixed or unmixed right so when i when we finally get to looking at solutions you'll see you know, there's a, a, a row for cross flow heat exchangers and it has solutions, but it doesn't just have one solution. It has like three or four different solutions based on, you know, do you have mixed fluid on 
one side transferring heat to mixed fluid on the other side or unmixed mixed and so on and so forth. So we have to understand what unmixed and mixed means. And basically what those terms mean, uh, it's just uh, as the flow flows through this heat exchanger. So here's fluid one, right? It's flowing through the heat exchanger in this direction. Is it possible for the fluid on one side of the heat exchanger, so over here, to mix with the fluid on the other side of the heat exchanger, so over here, right? So can the fluid mix in the direction perpendicular to the direction it's flowing, right? So here's a situation where that can't happen. And the reason it can't happen is because we have these geometric restrictions. We have these boundaries that prevent fluid that's over here from mixing with fluid that's over here. That's an unmixed situation, right? If I have a bunch of tubes, same thing. That would be unmixed. There's no way that the fluid flowing here can mix with the fluid flowing over here. And why that matters is because if the fluid is unmixed, then the fluid flowing on one edge of the heat exchanger can experience a very different path or very different thermal history than the fluid on the other edge of the heat exchanger. So imagine um, in this particular situation, um, what can happen? So here we have, let's say, the the the, the hot fluid, and maybe this is the cold fluid. So the, the black lines are the hot fluid, the blue lines are the cold fluid. So the, the hot fluid way over here on the left side, that's experiencing some interaction with the cold fluid just as the cold fluid enters. That cold fluid is as cold as it can be. So this hot fluid is going to actually get probably a lot colder than the hot fluid way over here that's experiencing interactions with cold fluid that's been heated up quite a lot, right? This is the cold fluid right before it leaves. And as a result, if this is an unmixed situation, this fluid over here is going to come out a lot colder than this fluid over here. You're going to have a temperature distribution that's two-dimensional in this fluid, right? You're going to get flow, changing temperature as it flows, but also changing temperature across the flow, right? And you can kind of see that over here. Now, this hot fluid came in all at one temperature, but as it went through here, the hot fluid that was sitting over here right next to the entering cold temperature, it gets a lot colder than the hot fluid that's sitting way over here that's experiencing thermal interaction with the exiting cold temperature, right? That's a lot colder. So I have a temperature distribution where, yeah, my hot fluid is changing temperature as it moves through the heat exchanger, but how much it changes is different. It, 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 how much it changes is different depending on where it is. So, you know, I have a, a two-dimensional temperature distribution, right?